as we are coming in, um, I wanted to mention a couple things. We, as you notice, the road project is getting closer and closer. We've got some new striping on the on the the the, the place where you put the cars. What is that? Parking lot. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, so you will notice that there is a traffic flow now that is going to be instituted. As you come in from Middleton, you're, you need to go around the building. If there's nobody here, then I don't know if anybody's going to get mad at you, but you will notice as it fills up that it makes more sense to make that loop around. These parking spaces out here will be all nose in and then back out, so it's one way through that, uh, through that section. I do not believe they are completed with their striping because you noticed how half of them were, were perpendicular and half of them were angled, which, uh, be careful when you leave today. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, this is Memorial Day weekend, and I know that, for one very pragmatic uh, uh, note, uh, some of our folks are not here. They're uh, occupied doing other things. I know quite a few of them are at camp, getting camp set up and, and running, and then... It is also an opportunity for those folks who can afford gasoline to go take a trip. Um, uh, it's kind of steep out there, but uh, for those of us that have gathered here today, it is a blessing to be together with you in the Lord's house. Ah, feels good. Memorial Day is an opportunity that we have to remember those folks that were precious to us that we have had to say goodbye to. And it's not an easy time to remember those folks. Traditionally, it has been for folks who have, uh, who have lost their life in service to their country. Um, but in practice, it is much broader than that. Everyone that we have loved, um, everyone that we have had to say goodbye to, everyone who's finished their race comes to mind this weekend. It's inevitable for us to do that. Um, particularly today, I think that we want to remember those who have lost their life in an untimely way, particularly down in Texas. It is <clears throat> yeah i don 't know what it means when we live in a place that this kind of thing happens, and I know there 's many different perspectives and we all feel like there's something we can contribute to the conversation, but we will pray for this. And if there is more that the Lord leads on your heart to do, I encourage you, actions do speak. But today I want to read something to you that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. It is a comfort when we reflect on those that we've lost. In Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, excuse me, he writes these words. Can't remember things and I can't see things. No. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others who, do not, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with an archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And invite you to enter into a time of silence as we reflect on those who have gone, who've either completed their race or perhaps have been taken from this life. <sighs> After that time of silence, I'll close us in prayer. If you would bow with me.
God of grace, you give us life. And life is a precious thing. We are not always as careful with it as we should be. But when it is gone, we feel it. Lord, this weekend gives us a special opportunity to remember those who have completed their race, who have fought the good fight, have finished well, have joined that cloud of witnesses watching and cheering as we complete our race. Lord, loss is never easy and always brings pain and grief. And yet we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And so, Lord, we cherish these memories, those we have lost. We grieve with those that grieve Lord, in whatever way that we can, we pray that you would use us as your instruments to bind up the brokenhearted. And Lord, help us to complete our race, to finish well, to be faithful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A somber note, yes, but we do not live without hope and encouragement, and joy as well. So we have come together to worship today. Carol, would you begin our service? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> wow. It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? The Lord's given us rain so that our plants will grow. And he's given us John. (laughs) I just had to blow my nose before I came up here, because, because, just because. I have a prayer for today. I'm going to start off with a prayer. And then we'll read Romans. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given us this day to use as we will. We can waste it or use it for good. But what we do today is important because we are exchanging a day of our life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something that we have traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss. Good, not evil. Success, not failure. In order that we shall not regret the price we have paid for it. Amen. Now it says in the program that I'm going to read Romans. 12 verses 1 through 2, which says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Somebody else's turn. It's your turn. The next song, uh, the first song that we're going to sing today is called God Who Touches Earth with Beauty. And I chose it from a different hymnal than the one we're going to sing out of. And many of you know the melody that I chose originally. This one's different. 
So Peggy's going to play the song all the way through first for those of us who have to learn a new melody. And then we're going to sing it a little bit slower than we might. And we're going to sing all five verses. And that way we can practice and get the new one well established in our head. So if you read music and would like to pay attention to the notes that are different, it's on page 511. Otherwise, it will be projected on the wall, whichever is your choice. And if you'd stand, please, and sing with us. First time, we're going to listen to the piano. God who touches earth with beauty, make my heart anew. With your spirit, recreate me pure and strong and true. Like your springs of running waters, make my crystal. Ready? I'm praying for a generous heart. Francis of Assisi prayed the following prayer. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be heard as to hear, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. Let us remember so we can keep coming back to this church. Amen. There is a miracle, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a miracle called friendship that dwells within the heart and you don't know it happens or when it gets its start. 
but the happiness it brings you always gives a special lift, and you realize that friendship is God's most precious gift. Thank you, Lord. Somebody else's turn now, Pastor. That's your turn. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. You're going to like it. Good morning. I'm going to talk about something today that we all have. Everybody's got what? Do you want to take a guess about what it might be? What do you think? I'm sure it's going to be a good guess. What do we all have? I'm not giving you very many clues, am I? Oh, I hope we all have friends. And friendship is very important. I'm, thank you, Carol, for sharing that. Well, I'm going to tell you how to maybe start friendships with this thing that we all have. Ready? Here it comes. Look here. Ready? What's that? A smile. A smile. I want to see your smiles. Everybody smile at me. That's a good one. That's a good one. Summer, where's your smile? Smile. As, oh, there it is. That's a good one. Peggy, that's a good one. Now, I want you to, my teeth are funny a little bit. These front two teeth kind of go together a little bit, and I've got this weird one down here that sticks out a little bit. And sometimes I don't like to show them off very much. And so I keep my mouth closed like this. And it's, it doesn't really communicate how much I like you guys, does it? When my mouth is closed like this. How are you going to know if I really like you? How about if I smile at you and even show those scraggly teeth that I've got? How about your teeth? Are they cool? They're pretty good. I see you kind of got a hole right there. Yeah, and that one's coming in really good. Yeah. Have you guys lost any teeth yet? Not yet. I lost three, but one is um, growing. One's coming out back out. That's what happens. Sometimes you get little gaps in there, and sometimes their teeth aren't really straight. And sometimes you may be a little embarrassed by it, but you know what? Every smile is beautiful. Whenever you see somebody smiling, isn't that the neatest thing? Don't you feel warm and welcome? It's just a wonderful thing to be in the presence of somebody who likes to smile. You just can't stop now, can you, Summer? She's just going to that smiley smile. Are they smiling at you back there? Well, they are, aren't they? <laughs> it feels good to smile. Smiling is a gift that God has given us that we can share with other people. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to remember to smile at people that you care about and maybe even smile at somebody you don't know. Because you know what you're going to do when you do that? You're going to make their day better. And that's how friendships are formed. How about smile when sad? Oh, if you could smile when somebody is sad... Not smiling at their sadness, but maybe helping cheer them up. That's a pretty good deal. To help you remember, I have stickers. And they're smiley face stickers. And I have gold ones and orange ones. So I want to put a smiley face sticker on the backs of your hands so that when you look at it, you'll remember to smile. Okay? You don't have to, if you can remember on your own, you don't need to have a sticker. But I'm going to put it on one on there for right now. Okay? So, smile. Do you want a gold one or a, an orange one? Point at the one you want. That one? Okay. All right. I don't have enough stickers for everybody in the church. They just have to remember on their own. Would you like a yellow one or a gold one or an orange one? A yellow one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Nancy, what color would you like to have? Would you like one? Point to which one you want. That one? All right. Okay. Here we go. What about this Let's put it on the back of your hand so you can see it. Is this a there you go. So whenever you see, yeah, probably, but you don't want the one that says colorful sparkle smiles. Because you all have sparkly smiles. All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for giving each one of us a wonderful gift of a smile. And every smile is perfect. Regardless of what's going on in our mouths, we are 
grateful to have this special gift that we can share with others. So help us to remember to smile. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. is Memorial Day, so I just have to mention my mother. Smile. She was good at it, and I never will forget as long as I live. We're going to sing Spirit of the Living God, and luckily it's a tune I know, so <laughs> please stand with me. feel like we needed to sing that twice do you need a reminder for the spirit of God to fall on you sometimes we might but it's there it's there all the time I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12 for our text this morning do remember that passage that Carol read earlier from Romans though it is kind of key to this and again, remember where we are too in the Gospel of Mark with Jesus having come to Jerusalem and getting into these conflicts and confrontations with the religious establishment. This is one more link in that chain, beginning in the 13th verse of that 12th chapter. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see, and let me see it. And they brought one. And then he said to them, whose head is on it and whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. And Jesus said to them, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. I'm not going to shock you today with this observation. Nobody likes taxes. I am correct in assuming that, right? Jim likes to. No, no. <laughs> it's probably one of the things that we have in common with the people in Jesus' time. Uh, I suspect that a, a lot of that has to do with what taxes represent. The idea that we work, we labor, we strive, and then somebody else, maybe somebody that we don't totally agree with, is going to come and take some of that money and then use it in the way that they choose. It's a little bit frustrating. But I think our common distaste for taxes may only go so far. You see, taxes in our day, they're a little different than they were for the Judeans back in the first century. We pay our taxes, we pay our state taxes, we pay our federal taxes, and, and to be honest, even though it doesn't feel that way at times, we do have a certain amount of say, at least through the electoral process or ballot initiatives or that sort of thing. 
in how much tax we pay and, and what we use those taxes for. For the Jews under Roman rule, there was none of that. They had really no say whatsoever in what their taxes were used for. And the tax rate back in the first century was basically whatever we can get away with. And it wasn't just Rome that did this. There were a whole lot of local taxes too. The Judeans, they were taxed by their local leaders. Herod Antipas had his own taxes that he would levy against the people. And tax collectors, the ones that went out and, and gathered this stuff in, they always took their cut too. So the bill was pretty significant. And this was on top of the, the offerings and the tithes that went to the temple. Another sort of tax. Altogether, common folks in that, that period of time would end up paying nearly half of their income in taxes of one sort or another. And really, the, the primary benefit, at least as far as the secular taxes were concerned, the primary benefit was that you didn't go to jail. That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? You know, stay out of jail if you can. But that was it. That's really all you got from it. You didn't lose your land. You didn't have it stuff taken away from you. If you could pay your taxes and not have to borrow too much to, to do it or, or perhaps to live on, you could just eke out a living and survive and maybe make enough to eat, uh, maybe make enough to pay the next round of taxes. It was kind of a legalized extortion, really. It's like you didn't really have a choice. You had to, had to pay it as far as the Jews were concerned. Now, those benefits, things like the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, Roman roads, and, and stable economic environment and, and commerce, all that stuff, for the average Judean, it's pretty abstract. Especially when you think that the people of Israel weren't really free. Uh, they felt that continual pressure of Roman oppression on their necks. And, and a gut level, Roman taxes, it was just one more reminder that they were not a free people, that they had this pagan empire on top of them, dominating them, keeping them down. We don't like taxes, but faithful Jews really, really didn't like taxes. Now, our universal distaste for taxes, it may cause us to misinterpret this passage a little bit you see we get focused on the tax part it's kind of what pops out to us whether or not it's appropriate to pay taxes to a government that you know, in their, their day didn't seem that just or fair or righteous now that may be a point but I don't think it is the central point obviously with most of what we come across in Jesus's words there's more going on here more that Jesus is saying now, as Mark is telling the story, we kind of know where we are. We're right in the middle of the conflict and the confrontation and the debate that happens when Jesus comes to Jerusalem and runs up against the religious leaders. And you know how it's progressed so far. He's come from the countryside up by Galilee, and he's come down to Jerusalem, and he enters in triumph with the hosannas and the palm branches and the cloaks in the street, and everything's going just really awesome and then he goes the next day to the temple and he cleans it out it's got all this stuff going on there that's no good they've got money changers and they've got stock selling and they've got all this stuff that that Jesus just is not right here and so he cleans all that out and then the religious leaders are like what's going on here what's this guy doing and they come to him and they ask him you know by whose authority are you doing these things it's speculation, I know. We don't really know. The text doesn't tell us. But sometimes I think that that cleansing of the temple that Jesus does is kind of a really a temporary thing. You know, that's, that's important commerce that's happening, and there's quite a bit of money involved with it. So I'm guessing that pretty soon after Jesus does all this, it's all back and going again, set back up and, and, and just chugging along. But I could be wrong about that. Another commentator makes the point that the fact that Jesus was able to do what he's doing in the text, going out to Bethany at night, coming back in, talking, teaching, moving around freely, well, it kind of indicates that the religious leaders were not just unwilling, but unable to arrest him. Jesus' influence in the crowds apparently was, was significant enough at that moment that he's essentially holding the temple occupying it, if you will, preventing the religious establishment from coming in and operating at all. It's possible that Jesus was staging some kind of a sit-in here 
where he's got all the people that are listening to him and responding to his teaching surrounding him and keeping him operating with impunity. The normal daily activities, that's all stopped. We don't know. It's interesting to think about. But either way, the religious leaders, they are not moving against Jesus openly. They can't do that. And so they come along and they try to trap him. They try to trick him. They want to turn the crowds against him. See, that's the word that Mark uses here, trap. It's a unique word in the New Testament. This is the only place that it shows up here in Mark's gospel. It's a word that means snare, like a, a, a trapper would snare his prey. And it makes the situation clear. They are hunting Jesus at this point. These two groups that come to him, that come to Jesus, they're the, the Pharisees and the Herodians. And they're sent they are sent to Jesus, no doubt by that group that confronted Jesus earlier, the ruling council who wanted to know by whose authority Jesus was act acting. And this is an unusual pairing, these two groups, the Herodians and the Pharisees. Under normal circumstances, you would not get them together. It's oil and water. They don't like each other. They don't get along with each other. On the one hand, you've got the supporters of Herod. They are completely complicit, totally in bed with the ruling Romans. And on the other hand, the Pharisees, they were resistant to that Roman rule, maybe not quite as much as the zealots who were willing to stick people with knives over it, but they were there. They didn't like this. Their focus on religious piety, it, it called a lot of the interactions with Rome into question. You don't go and talk with them. You don't eat with them. You don't even touch them. They're unclean. You will regret it. You will lose your place if you do. Now Jesus, uh, these two groups don't have a lot in common, but they do have one thing in common. They are both openly hostile towards Jesus. And Jesus represents something, a profound challenge to the way things are. And both of these groups like it the way it is. They want the status quo. Both of them are benefiting from that status quo. And so these two groups, they come to Jesus. And they bait this trap that they're setting for Jesus with that hypocritical flattery. How many of us respond to flattery? I don't know. Hopefully you don't. But it is a human thing. It's like, oh, good job. You're doing awesome. I really appreciate you. And, and when it's sincere, it's wonderful. But this is not that. It's hypocritical. We know you're sincere, they say. And you can almost hear that hypocrisy dripping off of it. We know you're sincere. We know that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. We know that you don't curry favor or show partiality. Did you catch the irony? It's all true. It's true about Jesus, but it's hypocritical because these two groups that are challenging Jesus... The representatives of the establishment, they don't really want that. They don't respond to Jesus' authenticity, his sincerity, his impartiality. They don't respond appropriately. They'd much rather prefer that he be a little less sincere, a little less honest, a little more partial towards them. And so they offer up what is, in their eyes, a backhanded compliment to Jesus, hoping that he'll throw him off his footing. And then comes the trigger of the trap. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's an interesting question. How many of you have asked that same question around April 15th? Maybe. Note, though, that they don't ask, is it right? Or is it appropriate? Or should we? They, they want to know if it's permitted. There, this is a question about the law. Is it lawful? Would Moses sign off on this is basically what they're asking. And this is a specific tax that they're talking about, the imperial tax, the universal tax that was applied to all subjugated people within the Roman Empire. It wasn't an income tax or a sales tax. It was, hey, you're part of this empire. You pay this. Now, Roman citizens didn't have to pay it just the oppressed people, and its purpose, above that of raising revenue, which I'm sure that it did, its purpose was to ferret out the disloyal elements of an oppressed people. You see, if you don't willingly pay this tax, if you don't line up on tax day with your, with your, 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 your money to take care of this, that singles you out. 
You're a a, a troublemaker. You're a problem. You're a possible insurrectionist. And it's pretty effective, really, when you think about it. The very people that were opposed to this tax in Judea, they're the most likely the ones that are going to rise up against Rome. And so these are the people that are having uh, Rome keep an eye on them. They want to keep tabs on them. And so here's the way these two groups structure the trap for Jesus. If Jesus, on the one hand, says, yes, it is permitted, then he's falling in line with the Herodians. And we all know they were in bed with the Romans. They were complicit. And, the, and he's, he's lining up against the Pharisee group and their strict understanding of the, of the law. But if he goes to the other side and he says, no, it's not permitted, then he's branded himself as an insurrectionist, a troublemaker, a problem. And right there in the temple courtyards, there's a fortress, the Antonia Fortress, where the Roman legion was stationed. And they were probably watching everything that happens in the temple grounds. And they would have known, oh boy, here's another one we've got to keep an eye on. If that's the way that Jesus had went. And I think these two groups think they've got Jesus in a no-win situation. How can he answer appropriately? If he answers one, he's going to have half the people mad at him. And if he answers the other, the other half is going to be mad at him. He can't win. But their question contains a logical fallacy. It's what's known as a false dilemma or a false dichotomy. The way the question is presented It's presented in a way that makes it look like there's only two possible answers. One or the other. Black or white. Yes or no. That's all you get. False dichotomies are always built up on a whole pile of assumptions. If this is true, if that is true, all these things have to be true in order for it to work. And many of those assumptions end up being pretty shaky. According to a false dichotomy, there are only two options, and only one of them can be true, and so you have to pick one or the other. And what makes it a fallacy is that it excludes any other potential true response, which is exactly how Jesus deals with this. He brings to light a more significant, a more profound truth. Bring me... A denarius, he says. I love it. I love how authoritative Jesus is. (laughs) Here are these people who who are supposed to be in charge of the place. And Jesus says, you do this for me. And they do it. They just jump right to it. They, 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 They bring this coin that is used to pay the tax. And this is an important part of the exchange, okay? We can assume that Jesus is in the temple. This is where he's been doing his teaching, where he's been been kind of occupying, if you will, and in the temple precincts. And we know that there's been this, this history of money exchange going on there in the temple. You have to exchange coins because the temple tax, the temple tax has to be paid in a specific coinage. You can't use certain coins to pay the temple tax. And the very coin that is not allowed to pay the temple tax were these Roman denarius. That image that is on them, that image of Tiberius, the emperor, the Caesar, the inscription on it saying, son of the divine Augustus, as if Augustus were somehow a god. And then on the back side of it, it said, Pontifex Maximus, high priest. The Roman coin was essentially just a little blasphemous idol that you could put in your pocket and carry around. That's what it amounted to to most Jews. It was an affront to the temple and to the God that resides there. And the fact that they were able to quickly produce one, one so readily right there in the temple grounds, that is in itself shocking. Not unreasonable that it would be there. Obviously, they're going to carry these things. But unreasonable that they would admit that they had one. Some more devout Pharisees wouldn't even touch one, let alone produce it when Jesus asks. And yet, here they are, the two groups, waving this coin in front of Jesus. Well, whose image is on it? Whose picture is on that coin? Whose title is on that coin? And we know the answer. The answer is Caesar. But again, when they vocalize it, when they verbalize it, when they articulate it right there in the temple... This little group that wants to trap Jesus is now trapped to themselves. 
You see, by identifying the image, by acknowledging that image, they're accepting Caesar's claimed right to issue the coin. They're accepting it as legal tender. And they're accepting his right to claim it as a tax. They're accepting Caesar's rule is essentially what's happening here. And by extension, Caesar's empire. You see, the question that they ask, they, they want to ask a question that's all about taxes and about the relationship of the people of God, the children of Israel, to these, what we would call civil authorities, what they would have called a, a pagan empire. And the question, it shows where they viewed themselves, where they fit into this whole civic and religious landscape. Taxes? Well, taxes are something that can't be avoided without consequence. The Herodians knew this. They were very accepting of it, not paying taxes, upset the system. And even though they wanted to draw more people into a disciplined observance of the law, the Pharisees, they were not interested in upsetting the system either, any more than the Herodians. This imperial tax is just part of doing business. It's just part of the way the world works. We have to do it. You see, the only thing the Pharisees were trying to achieve here was to get Jesus in trouble. They weren't trying to start some kind of an uh, anti-tax uprising here at all. Rome, hey, we acknowledge it. We've got the coin. We call Caesar Caesar. We acknowledge it. Rome is just too powerful for us to do anything about, and so let's just you know, maybe try to keep control of our little part of it. That's enough for us. And Jesus, well, he's upsetting that. All this to say that the real question here is not about taxes. While the Pharisees and the Herodians, they wanted to make it about taxes and limit the conversation, shrink it down to just that binary yes or no, either or, Jesus knows that there's a bigger issue at stake. You see, it's not just about the people of God and their relationship to the secular authorities, whether it be Jews in that day or Christians in ours. Now, I've heard this. I've said it. Perhaps you have heard it or said it yourself. This passage is often used as, well, this is what we have to do. April 15th, render under Caesar what is Caesar's. We use it as a justification to pay our taxes. We say, well, it's biblical. It's what Jesus called us to do. Now, that idea is probably supportable. <laughs> I think you could go to other scriptures that make it a little more so. But I do not think it's really what Jesus is talking about. I don't think Jesus is saying, yep, you got to pay your taxes. I think he's saying something else. It, if we think it is about taxes, if we think it, that that is the case, then we get caught in that same false dichotomy that the Herodians and the Pharisees were trying to use to trap Jesus. You see, they want the question to be about taxes. But Jesus says it's not about taxes. It's about loyalty. It's about who has sovereignty in our lives. It's about who we belong to and who should get their due. You see, we need to see the last line of Jesus' response as the... the the key, the linchpin, the hinge that all of this turns on. He says, yeah, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but then give to God what belongs to God. There are only two entities here that receive their due, Caesar and God, and he's saying, you know, you need to choose one or the other. But it brings up the question when Jesus says this, give to God what is God's, well, what is God's? What belongs to God? Well, this passage is connected to a very fundamentally, in a very fundamental way to the Jewish and then the later Christian understanding of God's rule over everything. The scriptures, they're explicitly clear. As a creator of all, all belongs to God. Look around the room. What do you see in here? It's God's. You see these people that you're worshiping with? Whose are they? 
They are God's. All belongs to God. We talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. Jesus had this parable about God planting a vineyard. It's God's vineyard. The people that are there occupying it, taking care of it, they're just stewards. It's not theirs, even though they try to treat it as theirs. We just had this story. In Psalms 24, David writes these words. The earth, and it's, oh boy, you don't get any more clear than this. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, for he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Do I need to interpret that? Not really. It's pretty clear. And I want to also be very clear here. It is one thing for us to acknowledge that. Yep, everything belongs to God. It's all God's. God made it. It's his. God's. Everything's God's. The earth is the Lord and all that is in it. It is one thing to acknowledge that fact. And it is another thing entirely to live that reality. You can say it all you want. You might even believe that it's true. But unless it has an impact in your life, it's pretty meaningless. David goes on in this psalm to say that those who enter into the holy presence, those who are with God, are those that have clean hands and pure hearts. There's something they have to do. There's something they have to be in order to be in God's presence. Those with integrity. It matters how you live. Those with integrity receive God's blessing. There's an application to this knowledge of God's rule. What the psalm tells us, along with the rest of the scriptures, it's all remarkably consistent, is that God is on the throne. God rules all. The whole earth and everything in it belongs to God and that we, as part of that creation... We need to live like that's true, which it is. Go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, God says that humanity is to be created in the image of God. Did you get that? In the image of God. And I don't think Jesus is unaware of this passage. Jesus knows the psalm. He knows the Genesis passage. That coin that has the image of Caesar on it, well, it belongs to Caesar. It's got his image on it, okay? Well, you, including myself in this, you, y'all, y'all, human creature, <laughs> you bear the image of God. Like a stamp on a coin. You bear God's image. You belong to God along with everything else in creation, which also bears the marks of God's handiwork. You see, any pretension that we have, to, to any pretension held by any earthly authority or power, whether it be for the imperial Caesar or the, the territorial despot or the, the heavy-handed religious oppressor or anyone, all of this is blown apart by this reality that the world is God's and everything in it is God's. You are the Lord's. I am the Lord's. I belong to God. Whether we acknowledge it or not, <laughs> we belong to God. And you know who's going to decide our ultimate fate? Not us. God does. So I will pose this to you. Would it not be better to be with God? Would it not be better to surrender to that loving lordship of God rather than trying to carve out our own little kingdom? You see, I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. He's saying that our preoccupation with worldly affairs, whether or not we should pay taxes, and there's a whole lot of worldly affairs that are wrapped up in this question, our preoccupation, it causes us to lose sight of God. We get so focused on the little minute details of this worldly life that we lose sight of God's perfect and rightful reign. Is it lawful to pay the imperial tax? I mean, think of all that's freighted inside that, of the worldly way of doing things, the worldly patterns of power and influence. 
It's about politics. It's about playing to the crowd. It's about the preservation of the status quo. The way things seem to be with this group on top and this group underneath. And if we stay there in that worldly pattern, it's a no-win for Jesus. He can't answer appropriately. Somebody's going to get mad at him. But because Jesus can look beyond that, can see more than just that, 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 that condensed, shrunk down, shriveled up little question, Jesus can tell us because he teaches in the way, uh, the way of God in accordance with truth. Jesus can see this false dichotomy for what it is. See, the, for the Pharisees and the Herodians, the, the important question has to do with how do we maintain our position? How do we stay in power? How do we keep control over the people? How do we do that in light of this taxation question? How do we maintain the status quo? And for us, it can be the same. We can be just as tempted about maintaining our status quo and our position, our place in society and our comfort and our ease and everything that we've accumulated. We want to know how to hang on to that. For us, it can be about taxes just like it was for them. But power and position and taxes, those are worldly concerns. If our primary focus is on those issues, then we're being conformed to the age. What Paul warns us about in that, that passage from Romans. It's not about taxes. If we think it is, we've fallen for that fallacy and the false choice that Jesus easily sidesteps. This text is about God's sovereignty. Is God in charge? That's what this, question, this text asks us. It's about giving God his rightful due. What does God deserve? And it is, with no exaggeration, everything. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Anything that we try to claim as personal property, as our own possession, from that single little coin that we would use to pay our taxes, all the way up to entire empires, all of that is still God's. It is only granted to us by God and we only take care of it as stewards. That's, that's the arrangement. So as stewards entrusted with the things of God, we take care of them. And sometimes that means paying our taxes. See, I knew we'd get around to that sort of question eventually. Sometimes it means paying your taxes. Sometimes it means questioning or even challenging what those taxes are used for. Ultimately, though, whatever it is, it is God's, as we are God's. Jesus may have taken a look at that coin that, that was being shown to him, presented to him, and maybe, maybe he said, yeah, you know, if Caesar wants his little chunk of metal back, go ahead and give it to him, because that's all it is. Just a bit of metal, just a piece of silver, if, if he wants it back, then, then go ahead and give it to him. But if something bears the image of the omnipotent and eternal loving creator of the universe, then maybe we should give that to God. Now that idea of offering ourselves a living sacrifice begins to make a little more sense. Caesar's pretensions to majesty, his imperial claims. Well, that only goes so far. They fall infinitely short of true majesty, true power, the rightful rule of God. So if we can come from this position, from a place where Genesis 1 is real, and we understand that we bear the image of God, from the place where Psalm 24 is real and we know that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. From a place where Jesus is real, teaching the way of God with truth, then we will recognize that our primary perspective has to be that God and what God wants is far more important for us to attend to than any question that we might have about the validity of taxation. 
What does God want? That is our guiding question. Living each moment under the rule and the reign of God. Living in the kingdom of God. Seeking that kingdom first. That puts the the rest of it, all of those worldly questions, it puts them all in their proper place. And we understand them better. They are secondary to our devotion to God. You see, when we finally give God his due, then everything else falls into line. Let's pray. Lord, we are human creatures. In that humanness, we get bound up in the things of this world. We know it. We live in a physical place with physical bodies and we have to deal with physical realities and often, Lord, we find that we pay more attention to them than we do to a greater spiritual reality that surrounds us. We forget that there's something bigger and grander and more wondrous beyond our physical vision. We get concerned about questions of taxation when we should be concerned with questions of loyalty. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us see more clearly, recognize more fully, to grasp what is the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of your great love. To not be conformed to this age, but to be transformed so that we might know your perfect will. And we pray for the strength and the courage to follow it. In the name of Christ, amen. I think this last song we're going to sing speaks to that we are gods and how we can show loyalty, very concrete images of how we show our loyalty to God. Please stand and sing with me, Take My Life. Take my hand. 
live so. If you would bow with me once again. Lord, we are ever only all for thee. You have called us and you have loved us and you have empowered us to be your people. Help us not get distracted. We pray for those who cannot be with us today for whatever reason. We ask that you would bless them specially. Give them a sense of your presence. And Lord, we ask that you would bring us together again so that we can praise and worship you and hear your word and be better equipped to serve you. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.